Distinguished guests and speakers, ladies and gentlemen, a pleasant morning. Welcome to the second day of the Geographic Information System, or GIS Workshop 101. This event is brought to you by the Urban Design Studio Laboratory of the UP College of Architecture. This is a three-part series of learning events on GIS scheduled last March 10 and today March 15 and on Thursday March 17. To formally open our webinar is Professor Rochelle Reya Reyes Barria. Professor Barria is an assistant professor at the UP College of Architecture and a professional architect with more than 20 years of experience in residential, commercial, institutional, and community architecture. She specializes in architectural lighting, urban lighting, and co-designing. She holds a master's degree and a bachelor's degree in architecture, both from the UP College of Architecture. Currently, she heads the UP College of Architecture Urban Design Studio Laboratory. Without further ado, let us give the floor to Professor Rochelle Reya Barria for her welcome message. Good morning. Welcome to the second day of our GIS 101 workshop. Today is a very special day in our series of workshops as our goal is to introduce the basic techniques which will enable our participants, architecture and landscape architecture students, professionals and collaborators to explore georeferencing applications, as well as methods on vector processing and over the ana analysis. We shall be referencing information on the entire Philippines and hydrological and climatological data from Pagasa, and specifically using San Juan City as a case for flood hazard exposure mapping. Can you get more excited about GIS and our agendas for climate action? Our organizers, the University of the Philippines College of Architecture, Urban Design Studio Laboratory, and our workshop speakers, Dr. A.E. Maliari and Mr. Miguel Del Rosario, have prepared a very interesting program and set of activities for today. The Urban Design Studio Laboratory of UPCA, the leading academic resource on urban design and community architecture in the Philippines, which seeks to be instrumental in creating healthy, livable, and inclusive communities, and in elucidating the Filipino urban identity, has been actively involved in the studies on climate adaptation, climate resilience, and disaster risk reduction and management. Through the researches and collaborative projects of our faculty in the past decade, our studio laboratory has made significant contributions in theory generation, in design applications, and community engagements. In 2013, Professor Michael Vito Meldan presented to the Asia Futures Conference in Bangkok his research on disaster resilient urban renewal of Makati City, Metro Manila. He proposed then that the blighted areas of Makati are also in areas of high hazard and pulling their lots together for land use planning, urban renewal and disaster risk reduction can in part be done to improve disaster resiliency, create security, attract more investments and boost its economy. Professor Timatan also described how our churches and heritage structures may be constructed and restored in his research entitled, Directions for Rebuilding Heritage with Sustainability in Bohol, Philippines in 2013. Also in 2014, Professor Tomel Dan and Professor Danny Silvestre, in collaboration with other faculty from UP College of Engineering, prepared the UP Tacloban campus plan after Typhoon Haiyan, or local name Yolanda. Dr. Romeo B. Santos, together with co-authors from the Florida Atlantic University, Anthony Abate and Mate Titisawat, surveyed and theorized disaster-resilient housing learning from hurricane resilient features of tropical vernacular houses in the Philippines and South Florida, USA. The long time architectural adaptation and localized building techniques of these vernacular houses were some of the features which made them resilient to typhoons. 
Other papers by Dr. Santos relating to climate were connecting the dots towards peri-urban climate change resilience, the case of Marquina City, Philippines, and how we recognize, produce, and use evidence for better policies, programs, and practice in view of SDG Stream 3 on environment, sustainable development, climate change, and resource and, and sustainable resources. Of recent date, Prof. Aaron Lextrones published studies on water energy nutrient nexus in the cities for the future. The case of San Jose del Monte Bulacan, 2020-2021, and the application of rapid assessment of wetland ecosystem services in Las Piñas Paranaque Wetland Park, Philippines in 2021. Indeed, the Urban Design Studio Laboratory has participated in the national and global efforts on finding relevant and creative spatial solutions to our climate agenda. From proposing macro scale plans on land use planning for urban renewal and disaster risk reduction to concrete urban designs on campus planning, architectural and housing designs for heritage and vernacular housing, to policies and practices on wetland ecosystem services and water management, energy conservation, and food production for cities. These are but some of the variety of approaches and frameworks we can all learn from and possibly build upon for re future researches and collaborations. The quest to find ideas, theories, and systems, designs, and policies, not just for climate action, but to create more humane, ethical, livable cities, and metropolis is indeed a priority for all, especially for our country. The lessons learned from 2013's Typhoon Haiyan or Yolanda identified the gaps in the existing DRRM systems and capacities for both national and local DRRM councils, institutions, and organizations. The recent Typhoon Rai, our local name Odette, which pummeled Visayas and Mindanao last December 16, 2021, has lingering and unresolved effects, especially with the lack of additional funding in the relief and rehabilitation efforts. The United Nations Office for the Coordination of, Human, of Humanitarian Affairs reports that daily food and nourishment needs, livelihood restoration of the displaced are still a priority. More than 42,000 people remain displaced across the typhoon affected areas. The number of damaged houses has increased to 2.1 million in regions 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, Mimaropa, and Caraga. While monetary aid and shelter toolkits have been provided to improve building enclosure for 66,000 families, 38,000 households still need assistance. An estimated 21 billion peso cost for school rehabilitation and reconstruction are needed. It is also reported that as of February 21, 2022, the national government devolved coordination and relief efforts to the local disaster management agencies and LGUs. Thus, a lot has still to be done in the planning, design, and policy implementation for this specific climatic ordeal. It is noteworthy to recall that in 2015, Climate Change Commission and the Housing and Land Use Regulatory Board formulated the supplemental guidelines for the mainstreaming of climate change and disaster risks in the comprehensive land use plans. Climate Change Vulnerability Assessment, or CCVA, and Disaster Risk Assessment, or DRA, are the two methods included in this document, which will enable our LGUs identify priority areas and development challenges and formulate informed decisions on spatial strategies, land use and zoning, which includes climate change and disaster risk mitigation in their clubs. The methods of these guidelines are the minimum steps we need to undertake in a design and build industry in servicing our communities. One of the many methods in site analysis, urban design and metropolitan planning, which essentially operates and develops the principles of open source softwares, a community of sharing and of collaboration is GIS or Geographical Information Systems. We can create, visualize, analyze, 
and model geospatial information with greater ease, speed, power, functionality, adaptability, and multi-software integration. Which, with such useful and versatile tool, how can we maximize this tool in our design efforts? To quote our speaker, Mr. Miguel Del Rosario, in his introductory talk for D1, the only thing that will limit your capabilities in using GIS is your creativity and imagination. With the workshops and webinars that we have today and have been organizing for the past three years and with the relevant researches and extension programs of the University of the Philippines College of Architecture, its seven studio laboratories, programs and offices, we hope that these shall be avenues for more discourses for our city's livability, sustainability, and climate agenda. Thank you again. Welcome, everyone, and a pleasant morning. Thank you very much, Professor Rochelle Baria, for a warm and inspiring welcome message. Just a short recap of day one of the GIS Workshop 101 was a basic introduction to GIS presented by Dr. Alyosha Ezra Malyari. And while part two, was an overview of geospatial technologies presented by Mr. Miguel Fernandez del Rosario. In today's webinar, we will have GIS data sources, formats, and inputs for part one. And while part two, we will be exploring different attribute types in GIS, coupled with some exercises that you will follow at the same time. Our guest speaker for today, Mr. Miguel Fernandez del Rosario, is a geographer with leadership and operational experience in GIS cartography, geospatial analysis, remote sensing, graphic design, and science research. He is a business development and marketing officer in Geospectrum Marketing Services and the Vice President of Geospectrum Analytics Services. He graduated from the University of the Philippines de Liman with a Bachelor of Science degree in Geography and is currently taking his Master's in Geography in the same university. Let us all welcome Mr. Del Rosario for his presentation. Hi and welcome to our second day of the GIS Workshop 101. For day two, there will be two parts. First, we'll tackle GIS data sources, formats, and inputs, which will help us georeference images to our project. In the second part, we'll talk about attribute types, joining and spatial queries, vector processing and overlay analysis. For our exercise, in determining flood hazard exposure for a particular area. But first, let's do a little recap of what we've done in the previous day. So we installed uh, QGIS, and then we also downloaded free data such as uh, OpenStreetMap of the whole Philippines from Geofabric, and the uh, administrative boundaries of the Philippines from the United Nations Humanitarian Index. We also had a little familiarization of uh, the interface of QGIS. So we took a look at, at the interface, the navigation, uh, adding some data, and changing the layer symbology to make it look more like a map. So firstly, let's talk about the data sources and formats for GIS. GIS software accepts many kinds of data, such as vectors. So these are the digital points. They could also be lines, polygons, and other 3D shapes. And for rasters, so these are the files that are made up of pixel data. So these could be like uh, images or pictures of other maps, uh, like scans of uh, older maps or paper maps. Uh, and also uh, rasters could also be imagery like satellite imagery or uh, aerial drone imagery. And then there are also other types of rasters like bitmaps that uh, represent other kinds of data other than just uh, pictures. So for example, uh, pixels in a raster could represent 
uh, land surface temperature, uh, and it could also represent uh, a particular uh, level of elevation in a terrain map. So another kind of uh, data that uh, GIS software accepts is a uh, table. So these are your spreadsheets. So for vector data, a very popular uh, file format uh, for this is the ESRI or SRI shapefile. So primarily uh, used in the ArcGIS suite of uh, GIS software. Though a lot of other GIS software like QGIS accepts uh, this popular uh, geospatial vector data format. So this is not just uh, one file type. So for example, if you have a shape file, it is composed of multiple files that you would see in your file browser. So most importantly are the uh, is the SHP file, the DBF, the SHX, the CPG, and the PRJ. So when we're moving around these files, so we have to be very careful of uh, keeping all of these in one place because if you miss one of these, uh, it could lead to uh, the software not being able to read the whole shapefile. So other kinds of shapefiles, for example, uh, QGIS defaults to using GPKG. Another popular um, file format vector uh, data file format is the geo uh, json so this is uh, readable especially by uh, gis software that is uh, found in the cloud so uh, there are a lot of web applications that are compatible with geo json so uh, the two other uh, data types that are available are kml and kmz so these are the um, the key uh, the keyhole markup language or the keyhole markup um, language zip uh, respectively so this is primarily used by uh, google for their google maps or google earth applications and again these are also readable by other kinds of gis software so i think especially uh, in the field of architecture uh, and design and uh, engineering so uh, CAD applications, computer-aided design applications are also uh, very popular. So a file format that is uh, used by those applications is the DWG file. So these could also be imported into GIS applications, but many of these files don't have any geographic information that, w that would enable you to uh, put it on a world map, for example. So you, you would need to perform georeferencing operations on it. So for raster data, uh, a very popular file format is the GeoTIFF or the TIF file format. And sometimes the, uh, these would have uh, another um, file attached to it, which is the OVR file. So uh, this um, tells the GIS software which um, projection system to use. So other types include uh, IMG and JPG. For tabular data, so usually that's uh, those are uh, Excel spreadsheets. And uh, more simply, uh, these could be the CSV files. So these could also be uh, understood by uh, GIS applications. And if uh, these have um, coordinate data embedded within them, these could be converted into um, for example, georeferenced point data that uh, you could easily see on a map. So for today, we'll need a little bit more data for our exercises. So first, um, we'll be using uh, Pagasa's Typhoon Tracks, specifically the Typhoon Tracks for Typhoon Ulysses uh, last um, 2020. Uh, I cropped this uh, image from uh, their Typhoon Track page and this has also been uh, uploaded into our exercise uh, folder. Another image that we'll use is the Central Luzon Link Expressway Project Phase 1 location map from the DPWH uh, PPP portal. So this has also been uploaded to our uh, exercise folder. We'll also need a flood hazard shapefile. So for this exercise, 
uh, will be using the five-year uh, flood hazard uh, shapefile of uh, Metro Manila, which we could find from the NOAA project of uh, UP. So georeferencing is adding geographical properties or references to data. So uh, this enables uh, the display and or manipulation in GIS software of the data that you have georeferenced. So basically, this is assigning geographic coordinates to specific points in the map or in the image that uh, you would want to georeference. So when should we be using uh, georeferencing tools? So we should be using uh, georeferencing when geospatial or georeference data is not easily available for that uh, type of information. So for example, uh, printed maps where you can't contact the publisher or it would require a purchase of a separate a data package or maybe they don't have that kind of data anymore or they don't want to share it. So very common would be archival and or historical images or maps that don't have the corresponding uh, digital georeferencing data that could easily be uh, read by the GIS software. So another purpose for this is to perform, uh, to enable you to perform quick geospatial analysis or geolocation of data. So what what we're really doing with the data is we're uh, digitalizing it, adding geospatial or georeferenced uh, points to it so that the GIS software could easily read it. And if this would enable us to integrate that georeference data to other geospatial data that we already have, so we could perform deeper levels of analysis with multiple kinds of data. So if you need to do the analysis uh, digitally or within GIS instead of just, for example, drawing or sketching on a map. So what can be georeferenced? Uh, first, um, maps with coordinate grids. So maps that have uh, lines that would indicate uh, which uh, latitude or longitude that uh, area belongs in. Uh, that is a that's a very easy candidate for georeferencing. But if you don't have that, at least you should have a map that has reference points that you could easily uh, reference the map to a uh, to a known area or data that you already have. So, for example, uh, if this map that you would want to georeference has buildings, or road junctions that are common to data that you already have. For example, maybe you already have OpenStreetMap road data that you could uh, align or georeference with, then we could georeference this data. But there are also other kinds of data that might be problematic uh, if we would try to georeference those. So maps often found in brochures like this one or advertisements might be difficult or impossible to georeference as they are often drawn by hand or are simplified using photo or vector editing software. Uh, they all might not also be made to scale, uh, but nevertheless, they could be uh, important sources of information, often, often acting as a supplement to other materials. There are also many maps geared towards casual or non-technical viewers. Uh, they're often based on real architectural or engineering drawings, just stylized for aesthetics and ease of use. Uh, extreme cases like this campus map, which is obviously rendered from a particular perspective that is not, uh, that is not completely top-down, uh, this might still be a candidate for georeferencing, but you also have to consider if the map is uh, oriented in directions other than uh, north, or if the perspective is per uh, perfectly top-down. Um, there might still be a chance as long as the distortion or perspective is known, or it can be approximated, or if the distortion is uh, consistent, that we could find the solution to uh, fix the perspective of this um, document. 
So on the flip side, uh, when should we not be georeferencing? So first, if the end product requires a certain accuracy and precision that we cannot achieve, so we should not be georeferencing that image. And we should find other data types that would, uh, or data sources. And if the end product will be a primary source or document for land titles uh, and engineering designs, which can have legal or technical ramifications. So you should always confirm with uh, field measurements uh, set certified by professionals uh, when, uh, we would, when you would need to produce a product that uh, requires uh, accuracy and precision that uh, your georeferencing operation could not provide. So still, um, if your project uh, is uh, tolerant or can uh, accept um, a particular type of accuracy or, and uh, precision, um, we should uh, strive to use uh, higher resolution images and images with uh, known projection. So these will help. These will definitely help with uh, georeferencing. Um, likewise, um, things that will reduce ac accuracy include uh, unknown projections and uh, if there are unidentified distortions in perspective and scale. Hi, we're back again here in our QGIS project. So for the first part of our georeferencing exercise, let's uh, take a look at the georeferencer tool. So it's up here. You can find it up here at the menu bar in raster. And then going to georeferencer. So just click that. So a new window will appear of the georeferencer. So to start, uh, let's select uh, raster or an existing map which we need to georeference. So we just click here, open raster. And then let's pick the files that we need. So let's use the typhoon track of Ulysses that we got from Pagasa. So it's not very high resolution, but I think we can work with this. So firstly, this is uh, one of the better cases of uh, imagery that we could use for georeferencing, as this has the grid lines or the co coordinates for both latitude and long longitude that we could use. So let's take note of those. So we could see the north to south or the latitude values from 5 degrees, 10 degrees, 15 degrees, 20 degrees, and 25 degrees north. And then we see the longitude. So that's uh, 115, 120, 125, 130, 135, and 140 degrees east. So let's try to set our parameters first here in the transformation settings button. So let's set parameters here. So for the transformation type, let's, uh, let's stick with linear since uh, this map is um, not very distorted. So let's keep that resampling method. And then the target reference system. So this is the coordinate system that we'll be using. So a very common projection or reference system that uh, maps use, especially for maps that rely on global data, is WGS 1984. So we'll just use that. And then let's, um, let's find a path for our output. So this will create a new raster file. And then let's just pick uh, this uh, option for the compression so that our file size won't be too large. And then we will need to save our ground control points. And then we'll also need to specify to load whatever we did in uh, our current QGIS project when 
this is finished processing. So let's proceed with that. And then click the Start Georeferencing button. So we could see that it says that there are not enough ground control points. So the linear kind of transformation requires at least two ground control points. For this exercise, we'll need to define four ground control points. So we could click anywhere in the map. So let's click at an intersection of uh, a latitude and a longitude line. So let's try to find a center. For example, here for the intersection of 25 degrees north and 115 degrees east. Let's try to find the intersection of that and just click that. And another dialog will open. So this will let us define the coordinates that uh, we would need for that point. So for X or East, so that's the longitude. So in this intersection, it was 115. So let's just type that. And for North, it's 25. So just click OK. And that will set the ground control point for that area. And you could see it being reflected here in the table. So let's find another point. So let's go to the extreme southwest of this map and look for another intersection. So, so here we have 5 degrees north and 115 degrees east. So again, let's try to find the approximate intersection of these two grid lines. And again, specify the map coordinates for that point. So 115 east and 5 degrees north. Press OK. So again, you could see it uh, being reflected here. So we could see the coordinates, the original coordinates of the image and the destination um, coordinates. So let's go to the extreme southeast. So this one is the intersection of 140 degrees east and 5 degrees north. So let's click that and specify that. OK. So for the extreme northeast, uh, we could pick between uh, a few points here. So since this part is obscured, I'm going to choose uh, 135 degrees east and 25 degrees north. there so the point might be moving around if you were uh, zooming in and zooming out so you could just move that again that's okay so just uh, click on a new point while you're zooming in and out in and out so let's refine that a little bit So 135 east and 25 degrees north. Okay. So we've set up our points here. We could add uh, even more for greater accuracy. But for this kind of map, uh, four points would suffice. So let's try to run it again. This time, hopefully, without errors. So since that was a very uh, low resolution map or image, the processing was finished uh, quite quickly. And we could see in our main, we could see in our main uh, QGIS uh, window that the new file has been added here. So let's try to zoom out. Or we could uh, right click this new georeferenced uh, image, click zoom to layer. So there. So we've zo zoomed in here. We can see the map, uh, the image again in our uh, map viewer. And to try to verify if the uh, if the georeferencing is uh, correct, we could mouse over uh, and put our mouse pointer near the intersections that we have specified or in any of the other uh, intersections in this grid. And we could see that the coordinates are changing here uh, below here in the 
bottom panel, we could see the coordinates changing while we are mousing over the different intersections. Another way to check uh, is by using another existing uh, geographic or geospatial data set, such as what we have loaded already in our previous exercise. So we had the Philippine administrative boundaries. So we could just uh, put that up here so that it would be on top of the image of the map. And you could see that it is reflecting um, quite accurately. There doesn't seem to be any deviation from this uh, distance. So for the second part of our georeferencing exercise, let's take a uh, look at the other map that uh, we have downloaded. So this is the Central Luzon Link Expressway project location map uh, from DPWH. So uh, what's different from this map is that uh, we don't have any uh, grid coordinates or coordinates on a grid system that we could use to easily uh, input the coordinate um, coordinates or the coordinate points uh, but what uh, what we do have here is a Google Maps kind of um, map display that shows the uh, for example the main roads and the other um, points of interest that uh, you would um, usually see in a Google Maps type of display so what uh, we would make, uh, what we would uh, need to um, take into account here is uh, the general location. So this uh, expressway uh, spans uh, the province of Tarlac and Nueva Ecija. And uh, we should also take into note some uh, important uh, road intersections that we could use as our reference points. So let's go back to the QGIS application and then turn off uh, the Ulysses track uh, georeferenced image. And then I'll try to zoom in to between the Tarlac and the Vaisia area here. So if you're not uh, familiar with that area yet, um, approximately it is uh, in this area of uh, central Luzon. And then using just the OpenStreetMap uh, interface, uh, we could easily see these areas. So I'll turn that off again. And then let's go back to our georeferencer tool. So I've already uh, snapped this georeferencer interface into the main QGIS interface. So you could just uh, drag and drop these different panels around and you could integrate it uh, back into the map display. So here I could drag it, uh, drag it uh, back down again so that we could work on both the georeferencer and with our uh, reference uh, OpenStreetMap layer. So let's add that uh, CLLEX location map. And then let's start by uh, assigning those uh, ground control points between uh, their common road intersections. So first, um, let's try this. Uh, this is a Santa Rosa uh, to Tarlac Road. And uh, there's a significant uh, intersection here. And uh, using the OpenStreetMap uh, layer here, we could uh, also find that uh, major intersection. So to align or to tie both of those points, again, uh, let's use the add point tool in the georeferencer. And then 
try to zoom in uh, as much as you can to see the uh, approximate intersection of this area. So I'll just click here. And then again, this dialog will uh, pop up. And instead of entering uh, map coordinates, we could just use the option here to pencil in a point from the map, uh, from the main map canvas. So let's click that. And then let's click the corresponding intersection here in our OpenStreetMap layer. So I'll try to center it as best as I can. So I'll try to zoom in. Uh, try to zoom in again and then click so there uh, it has uh, entered uh, the coordinates that it found for that area so let's just confirm so that's one point so let's look for another major intersection that uh, we could uh, definitely see from this uh, map so let's look around the Cabanatuan area Here's another major intersection around here to the north of uh, Cabanatuan proper. So let's zoom out again here in the top map display. So this is the intersection that uh, I was looking at here at the bottom. So again, let's uh, try to zoom in as much as we can and then try to click uh, click through the intersection and then again click the from map cam uh, canvas button and then enter the corresponding intersection in the top display so uh, I'll just try to put that here and then press OK and then I'll try to find another one so this is the Pan-Philippine Highway and the uh, Nueva Ecija Pangasinan Road and another intersection with uh, AH26 here that we could see. So I'll try to um, choose the intersection here. Then again, click the map uh, canvas button and then find that uh, place in the top portion of the map so it's here so zoom in a little bit more and then click and then click ok okay let's find a, another one so let's try this one uh, an intersection here in uh, Herona municipality in Tarlac. So let's try to find the same place in the top panel first. So there, this is the same intersection. So let's put a point there. And then again, click uh, from map canvas and then zoom into the intersection. and then click and then OK. And then let's try to run the georeferencing operation. So it's telling me to set a transformation type. So again, uh, let's try this transformation type again, uh, linear. And then the take note of the location of the output raster and the compression type and to save the GCP points and to load in the image when we're done georeferencing it. So let's click OK. And then let's run it again. There, so the raster was successfully georeferenced. So there might be instances where you'll get an error where it might not be able to georeference it properly. Uh, there are other solutions for this. So first, you could try uh, using the delete or move GCP point uh, tools and try to move around the points 
so that uh, it will so the software will be able to uh, better interpret the georeferencing operation you're trying to do. Um, another way is to change the transformation settings and um, change the transformation type, for example, to polynomial one. But uh, because that's a different kind of transformation, you would need uh, a lot more GCP points. So I think for polynomial one, you would need six GCP points. But I think um, the georeferencer was able to handle the points that I have given it. So I'll exit the georeferencer first so we could take a better look at the main map display. So here it's generated a new uh, raster as we have specified. And as you can see, it has been embedded into our uh, map display using those reference points. And we could try to check if uh, it has been georeferenced correctly. So one way to do that would be to check the properties uh, of this new file. So uh, right clicking and then check the properties. So we could change the transparency, the global opacity of this layer. So maybe setting it to around 15%, 17%, applying it. So we could, we could play around more with the opacity and see if the lines, the major road lines, the rivers, for example, line up. There. So I think that's okay. I think that has been uh, georeferenced uh, correctly enough. So we could use this uh, image, for example, in our subsequent uh, operations or exercises. Uh, we have a lot of data that uh, we don't have in the original layers. For example, uh, where is the location of this proposed uh, expressway project? So we could digitize that and add that to our own data as well. And we wouldn't have that if we didn't uh, georeference this map. Thank you very much, Mr. Del Rosario, for part one of today's workshop, focusing on GIS data sources, formats, and inputs. For now, we shall take a five-minute break for you to relax and take in the lessons and information that we have learned for part one of today's workshop. Just a few reminders for those who have questions Regarding Mr. Del Rosario's lecture, please send them through the link shown on the screen. This is also the same link to the feedback form, which you will be filling out in order to receive a certificate of attendance for day two of the GIS Workshop 101.
The second part of the program is the continuation of Mr. Del Rosario's presentation, which now focuses on the different attribute types used in GIS. Let us welcome again Mr. Del Rosario for part two of today's workshop. So let's proceed with the exercise of determining flood hazard exposure uh, using uh, all of these different concepts and tools. So for the exercise for part two of day two, we're back here at the QGIS app. So I have loaded the administrative boundaries at the municipal or city level for the Philippines. Uh, what I find uh, very uh, peculiar about this data set is that it has separated the uh, sub-areas of Manila, for example, Binondo, Quiapo, Ermita, and Malate, into different sub-areas, even though these aren't municipal level boundaries. So we could try to fix that so that uh, this whole area would be just uh, a singular city of Manila. So let's check out the attribute table. So as we have discussed, uh, these are the different fields or columns representing the different attributes of this data set. So we have the municipal level names, for example, here in the column ADM3 underscore EN with the corresponding geographic code used by the government. And then we also have the different uh, provinces with their corresponding codes as well, followed by the regions and their codes. So to look for uh, all of the sub areas of Manila, there are many different uh, methodologies that we could use to locate all of them, uh, to select all of them, and then to merge them into uh, the singular city of Manila. So one method is to um, look for all of these manually and look for all of those areas that belong to the uh, city of Manila. So what I'll do here is uh, sort this attribute table according to regions. So for example, sorting it by the geographic uh, regional code will also sort uh, the rest of the table. So let's uh, look for national capital region. So here we could also see the entries for the city of Manila. So let's try to sort it now by the provincial codes. So there, so we could see a neatly arranged all of the entries for the city of Manila. So we could select uh, all of these uh, by dragging through the attribute table and you could see that all of these sub areas of Manila are selected. So what I could do is uh, edit this uh, entire shape file. So by toggling into editing mode, we are able to change uh, all of the properties of this whole shape file. So we could uh, type in new attributes, change the name to whatever we, we want. And we could also, and as you could see in the display, um, we could change the shape even of this uh, of these shape files. But uh, what uh, we'll do right now is to just uh, merge all of these sub areas. So let's bring up uh, another new toolbar. So this is the advanced digitizing toolbar. So I just right click into uh, this toolbar area and we could customize uh, our different panels and our toolbars. 
So I'll just check uh, the advanced digitizing toolbar. And there's this uh, new toolbar here. So they're uh, looking through the different uh, options or tools or functions. Here we have the merge selected features. So what this will do is uh, merge what we have selected in this attribute table. So let's go back to the attribute table and confirm that we have selected all of the sub areas. And then let's try to merge all of it together. So once we click that, another dialog will show up. So what uh, this is basically saying is uh, it gives you a list of all of the features that uh, will be part of the merge operation. So as you can see, these are all of the sub areas of Manila. And then at the bottom here, it would show um, the attributes that would be inherited by this uh, new larger merged feature. So by default, it would just select uh, the one that it sees first. So in this case, it uh, it's ID number 211, uh, which is uh, Binondo. So there are many options. Uh, you, you could just uh, pick whatever uh, feature you want to inherit. Uh, the merge feature to inherit or you could specify it yourself so you could just uh, rename it here so I could just type in city of Manila and then press OK so there it, it's already applied the, the changes that I requested so this is now the city of Manila. And then we have a few options. We could um, we could undo whatever we did. And uh, or we could also save uh, whatever edits we've made. So I'm good with this change. Uh, we could save it. Wait for the data set to save. So this is taking a while because this is uh, saving again the entire Philippines. So I could uh, toggle the editing again to stop editing so that uh, we won't be making any uh, unintentional changes. So there, I clicked it. So all of this is grayed out again. I'll turn off the advanced digitizing toolbar so we could have uh, more space for this exercise. Next, let's load in the census data. So this is the uh, Excel file that uh, we downloaded from the UN Humanitarian Exchange. So QGIS uh, recognizes this file type, even though it's not a geospatial format like uh, shapefiles or uh, geotiffs, geotiff rasters. So we could open this and just load in a particular uh, sheet from, from the whole spreadsheet. So let's load in this one, the uh, admin level 2 2022 file. So we could just uh, drag it in. And then as you have noticed, uh, there are no uh, options for zooming into this layer as um, there's no geographic data that the GIS uh, software, as well as uh, geometric data, like uh, the lines that form these boundaries. Uh, there's nothing in that Excel file that would uh, help the GIS software uh, in rendering this. So we would need to join this uh, census data into our uh, administrative boundaries. But first, uh, let's take a look into this uh, file. We can open the attribute table and we could see that uh, these are the uh, fields and columns 
So we have the regions and the uh, provinces. And we also have uh, population figures. But what we don't have here are the um, municipal um, boundaries or the municipalities. So what I'm thinking is, because we only have uh, census data up to the province level, we might have trouble joining uh, that data to our uh, current uh, administrative boundary data. So we could simplify this um, administrative boundary layer and just have a, a shape file where we only have the provincial boundaries. And this is possible because, uh, as we have seen already, we also have the attributes for the uh, provinces in this file. But before we proceed uh, with that, um, sometimes uh, there are problems with uh, these shapefiles, especially if uh, these were generated uh, incorrectly or were um, generated using a different uh, GIS software. So there might be some incompatibilities even though um, all of these uh, softwares could process um, shapefiles. So for QGIS, uh, let's go to settings first and then go to the options. Go to processing here, the bottom, and then go to general. And then um, go to the option of uh, invalid features filtering. So right now it's at uh, stop algorithm execution when the geometry is invalid. So we could click that and uh, change it to do not filter for better performance. So let's click OK. And then let's use the dissolve tool. So again, I'll type dissolve here. It's under the vector geometry folder. Double click that. And then make sure we're working on the administrative boundary layer. And then for the fields that we would use to dissolve, this is our shape file. So let's click the button with the ellipsis here. And then choose all of the fields relating to just the provinces. So this is the level 2 or the ADM2 fields. So we'll check those. Click OK. And then make a new layer or shape file. So I specified my NSPH underscore provinces dot SHP. Save that. And then run. So this is taking a while because this is dissolving the entire uh, shapefile of administrative boundaries in the Philippines. There. So it has uh, finished, and I think it's uh, successful. So we could just close this. And it's generated a new layer. So let's turn off the old one. As you can see, if we zoom out, we could see that it has been dissolved into 
just the provinces. So we could double check that here, open the attribute table, and we could see that uh, we only have the we only have uh, one province instead of having multiple uh, entries, for example, for a particular province, because there are multiple municipalities within that province. So there's uh, there's just uh, one entry for each province. So we could label that uh, here by changing its properties, change the labels, and then let's uh, name it according to the level two underscore en. So there, it's labeled by province. One thing I also noticed is that the shapefile that we just dissolved still has the national capital region divided into its four districts. So we also need to check the census database and see how they have arranged the national capital region there. So for the census, it's only, um, they only have statistics for the whole of the national ca capital region. And they have this corresponding geographic code. So we can just uh, edit that in our just dissolve province shapefile.
So let's select the geographic code of the NCR here. Just select this cell, right click, and then select copy cell content. Then we could exit this attribute table and then go to the attribute table of the province's shapefile that we dissolved. You could start editing again here by toggling it. And then going to the four districts of NCR here. Select these. And then turning on the advanced digitizing toolbar again. So we could select the merge selected features button. So the merge features dialog appears again. We could change the uh, province code, but I think it's already been applied here. We don't need to change anything. And there. You could still rename the, um, the name of this as we haven't changed it. Here. and then paste the admin code. And then toggle editing mode again to uh, get the prompt where you would need to save it or discard it. So let's choose save. Now we can try to join the population data in our dissolved provinces shapefile. So let's search for join in the processing toolbox and then select join attributes by field value. So let's set as our first input layer our dissolve province shapefile and then define in the table field their common field. So this is the level two or the province level geographic code so let's select for the second input layer our population data and then for its corresponding field let's also choose the same uh, field name so let's define the where to save it so I'll just overwrite this one that I tried to make earlier and then run it. So it was successful. 84 features from the input layer were successfully matched. Let's just close it and take a look at the results. So we could uh, check the attribute table of this new generated shapefile. And then move the table all the way to the right and we could see these new attributes being joined to our provinces. So importantly, we have here at the start of the join we have the female, male, and the total uh, population for this time period. So we could use that to change the display or the symbology of our layers. So we could try to zoom in again to the entirety of this layer. 
right click go to its properties go to symbology and then let's check out uh, categorized and then we could set the value as the total population here and then we could click classify So what this does is assign a, a unique or separate color for each of the values. We could try that, click apply, and we could see that the different colors are applied. But I think uh, we would need a different kind of uh, symbology categorization or rendering. So let's try graduated. So again, the value would, uh, that we would be using is the total population. And let's try this color ramp first. So let's click classify and then click apply. So there, using the symbology, we could roughly see where, uh, which provinces have uh, more population than others. We could add more classes here. For example, we could add 10 classes. And we could see the uh, legend or the symbology changing. We could also change our color ramp by clicking here. For example, turbo. And then clicking apply. So there. That also changes the symbology. So now that we've tried to join uh, attributes together between a shapefile and a uh, tabular data type like uh, an Excel spreadsheet, let's try to use the search by attributes uh, tool. So first, uh, let's go back to the shapefile of the municipalities. So yeah, it's taking a while to load because of the many data entries. So you could just try to focus on a smaller area so that it will load faster. So quickly, we could use this uh, type to locate uh, dialog here at the bottom left. And you could use this to search for uh, different uh, features. So for example, we could type F that would correspond to all of the active layer features. And then type in Quezon City, for example, or Quezon, since this is a, uh, oh, so we accidentally um, clicked on the census layer. So this is the active layer feature that uh, QGIS was uh, referring to. So we could just click here for the municipality's shapefile and then try to search it again. So here we have more entries coming up. So it shows all of the features, for example, um, of Quezon, for example, and Quezon City. So we could try clicking that. There, so it so it flashed uh, briefly for Quezon City, but you could already see that the problem here is it uh, there are um, many uh, features showing up, so it might be difficult if we are handling uh, very large databases. So we could try to look for uh, Quezon City. Um, programmatically so now let's try select by attribute and then make sure that the input layer is the municipalities layer 
then we could look for a particular attribute. So again, we could look for municipalities, provinces, and even regions. So we could select uh, the level three or the municipalities or the cities and their names. Then we could type in Kazan City. And then click Run. So it selected Kazan City here, as we could easily see. And we could also notice that it hasn't selected any of the other uh, items, for example, Quezon Province. So it has selected this one. If we want to deselect it, we could just uh, select uh, this option to deselect features from all layers. We could also select by expression. So this would help us. So this would help us uh, use multiple uh, search parameters to look for the particular feature that we would need. So let's click this expression button. And then this would bring up a page or dialog where we could uh, type in our uh, code. So this uses the SQL or similar to a SQL uh, programming language. And we have uh, different options here that would help us uh, do some simple coding. So we could look for fields. For example, we are looking for a municipality called San Jose. So we could double click this and then type the equal sign and then use, for example, type in San Jose and then enclose that in single quotes. You could try running that. But I think the problem would be that there are multiple San Jose's uh, selected. So what if we were looking for a particular San Jose? So let's go back to this uh, expression generator. And then we could create another uh, variable. So let's enclose this in parentheses first. And then add a conditional, so end, and then add another parentheses. So let's also look for, uh, so let's say we're looking for San Jose and Tarlac. So let's choose the um, field for the province name. And then select the equal sign and then type in Tarlac in single quotes. We press OK and then run it again. There, so it's uh, only selecting the San Jose in Tarlac province now. So another tool that we could use is the Select by Location tool. Let's try it out by adding another shapefile from the OpenStreetMap database. So I'm picking the railway shapefile here. So we'll just drag it here, wait for it to load. And then let's change the symbology to make it a little bit more visible. So I'll change it to the default railway design. So first we could uh, try the select by location tool. And then we could tell it to select features from our municipalities, uh, municipal boundaries. 
and then to tell it to compare it to features that uh, intersect with our railways shapefile. So we could run that. So it will search uh, for all of the municipal boundary features that intersect with all of the railways mapped by the OpenStreetMap project. So the tool has finished running. We could close it. And we could see uh, all of the cities or municipalities that have intersections with railways. We could also use the select by location tool to isolate uh, particular features that are encased within a particular uh, polygon from another uh, feature. So now let's add the uh, building shape file from OSM and wait for it to load. So here we, we could see being uh, slowly drawn out the buildings that were digitized by the OSM project. So it might take a while to load in your system as it is trying to render all of the digitized uh, building footprints around our map layout. So this is not trying to render uh, all of the features in the Philippines, but only near the vicinity of our layout. So say we want to select all of the buildings located in San Juan. So first, we could select um, our municipality layer again, and then just uh, select San Juan. And then let's go to select by location again. And then specify that uh, we should select features from the building shape file and look for features that intersect with our municipality boundary shape file and to not forget to check the selected features only so it would only intersect with the polygon corresponding to San Juan instead of um, intersecting with the entire shapefile. So let's run this and wait for it to run. It might take a while. So the tool has finished running and we could see that uh, 1,410 features were selected from the buildings uh, layer from OSM. So we could uh, also extract that and create a new shapefile so that, uh, so that we could just work on those buildings. So we could select the building shapefile, right click it, and then go to export. And to save selected features as, instead of just saving all of these features as. So we say save selected features. Specify it as an yeah, S3 shapefile and then define a file name for that. So let's just say send one buildings OSM. And I think these options are okay. We'll add the same file to the map and click OK. there so let's turn off the gigantic the original osm building shapefile and we could see that uh, all of the features intersecting san juan uh, city have been extracted into a separate shapefile so there's also another way of doing this so I'll turn off the visibility of this uh, 
shape file that we just generated and try it again. So this time we could use a different tool. Let's go to vector, go to geoprocessing tools. And then choose clip. So we'll select as our input layer, the building shapefile again, the original one. And then choose as our overlay layer, the municipality uh, boundaries. And then click selected features only. So again, we're just focusing on the city of San Juan. And then specify uh, an output location. type in San Juan buildings using clip to distinguish between the shape file we just created. So let's run that. So it might take a while again. So the tool has finished running. Let's close that. So let's try to observe the differences between the tools that we just used. So here, for example, for the shape file that we just made using the clip tool, there's a bit of a difference using the earlier tool that we used. So let's change the arrangement of the layers and change the colors a bit to add a, a little bit more contrast. So. Let's make this a green. So here we could easily see the differences. So using the select by location tool, it selects all of the buildings that intersect the city of San Juan, even if the intersection is not complete, even if the um, concerning feature is not completely within the city boundaries. So let's turn that off. And we could see that if we use the clip tool, it will clip it like you're clipping something with uh, scissors, for example. So that's the difference between the two tools. So there are other uh, geoprocessing tools that we could also use. For example, we could use the intersection tool or the union tool, but those have different results as well. So you could try those out as well. Now let's try to load the flood hazard shapefile that we downloaded earlier. So let's add this one, the five-year flood hazard for Metro Manila, and then add it here. So again, this is quite a large shapefile. So I think it would do well again if we could uh, clip our results to just the city of San Juan. So again, let's go back to geoprocessing tools and clip the flood shapefile instead using, again, our municipal boundary shapefile and then selecting selected features only. And then let's make another output. We'll type in San Juan five-year flood, for example. So I think uh, another piece of good advice is I would um, discourage you to put numbers or symbols as your first uh, character for your file name, as this could lead to errors, especially for uh, GIS applications. So let's run that. There. Close that, and then let's close our original flood hazard shapefile, and then turn off the buildings for a while. And here we could see the flood hazards for the city of San Juan. So let's change the symbology for that. Let's go to categorize, and then use this uh, single field value, var. Then let's classify. So for the NOAA 
flood hazard shape files these uh, three values correspond to low medium and high flood hazards so we could make uh, the low hazard let's try to make it a yellow make medium and orange and make high a red okay let's try that apply there Let's deselect our, all of our selections since the city of San Juan is still selected. There. So now that we have the um, clip flood hazard shapefile, we could try to determine the buildings that are affected by these floods. So I'll just change the symbology of the bu buildings for a while. Let's make it a green outline. Maybe that's a bit too thick. Let's make it a bit thinner. Let's try a stroke width of... Let's try... 0.1 millimeters. Okay, maybe that's okay. So by visual inspection, we could already see which of the buildings are could be affected by this five-year flood hazard. But again, we could use our overlay analysis uh, or spatial query tools. So for example, we could select by location and see which of the buildings are intersecting with our flood hazards. So let's change that. And then try to run it. to see it better uh, we could see that 5070 features or buildings are affected by the floods there so we could see these lines these selected buildings these are the ones that are affected by the flooding we could be uh, even more specific so let's uh, deselect that and use the select by expression query. So first, um, let's try to look, uh, let's try to select just the high hazard. So var equals, so I think Let's look for, so we could use this feature to select for the different kinds of uh, values that they have found for the field var. So we could use that. And click OK. And run that. So it has just selected all of the high flood hazard areas. We would need to overlay that uh, with our buildings. So we'll, let's try to run the intersect tool here in the geoprocessing tools under vector in our menu. So our input layer is uh, the building shape file. And then we'll overlay it with our five year flood hazard. And then using just uh, the selected features only so that we would only overlay or intersect it with the high flood hazards so let's save that let's name it with 
high flood and try to run it. There. Deselect everything again. Let's turn off the flood hazards. So here we could see all of the buildings that are intersecting or that could be affected by that uh, by high hazards in a five-year uh, flood scenario. So this is uh, what the basic uh, spatial queries and overlay analysis looks like. So we've tried to look for buildings affected by uh, certain flood hazards. And we have uh, isolated or selected only a subset of features using uh, other features that are related to a particular feature. Thank you very much, Mr. Del Rosario, for your comprehensive and step-by-step -step instructions with regards to the use of GIS. Again, for those who have questions on Mr. Del Rosario's lecture, please do send them through the link shown on the screen. This is also the same link to the feedback form, which you can fill out in order to receive a certificate of attendance for day two of the GIS Workshop 101. Looking forward to day three of the GIS Workshop 101. We will be talking about fundamentals of digitizing and map layouts. See you on Thursday! And to everyone, thank you for joining us today for Day 2 of GIS Workshop 101. We hope that this session has spurred your interest in geographic information systems, and we hope to see you on the third day of the workshop. Again, Thank you and have a great day ahead.